Hey friends, welcome to a new episode of the Ian Khan Show. I'm interviewing Nell Watson today. She is a deep machine vision pioneer. She serves as vice chairman of the IEEE B7001 committee. She's also a senior scientific advisor to the Future Society at Harvard and holds fellowships with the British Computing Society and Royal Statistical Society. A big warm welcome to Nell Watson. Hi, and welcome to the Ian Khan Show. I am doing an exclusive interview series with contributors to the recent book, Aftershock, and you can see it right here. Aftershock is a book that just came out, and it captures the thoughts of the world's top 50 futurists 50 years after Alvin Toffler's book, Future Shock, was published. I have with me today, Nell Watson. Nell Watson, she is a machine intelligence engineer. There's a lot of work. Uh, in the realms of uh, machine learning, machine intelligence. And uh, her essay in Aftershock is, is actually not so much about the future as much as it's about new concepts that can change the way we do things. Now, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. I've been um, reasonably happily self-isolated the last two and a half weeks or so. Um, haven't gone stir crazy so far, so... It's a good sign. <laughs> and it's, it's the same everywhere. It's the same everywhere. We all are going through this um, different way of living, I think. I don't know. It, it looks like a big lesson. It looks like a big change, but hopefully short-lived. And uh, I personally, my goal is to, is to maybe learn something from this whole experience. It's just an experience that I think we're going through. How are things where you are? Um, and tell us a little bit about what you've gone through over the last few weeks, just for us to capture this moment. Sure. I'm, I'm in Northern Ireland at the moment. I, um, I, I keep a base in Belgium, but I decided to go back to Northern Ireland where I, I grew up in order to shelter with, um, with family. I, um, it's, it hasn't been too crazy here yet um, compared to some other parts of Europe. Um, it's, it's been quiet. <laughs> it's, it's been a good chance to do some spring cleaning. It's been a good chance to do some reading, some thinking. Um, and I've been, I've been trying to help to coordinate people to be safer. So I've been, been doing a few of these kinds of um, podcasts and videos, etc., cetera, with um, tips for people's physical safety and also their mental and emotional safety as well. So I think that although these times are definitely a bit of a roller coaster and are a little disconcerting for sure, I think if we can try to take some meaning from this, that it is a chance to, to try life at a different pace and to refocus on the things that really matter, our health, our family, our social connections, then I think um, it, it might we might be able to find meaning in that. And who knows, it might even teach us something about the really important things in life. That's my hope anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And well said. And um, there's, you know, I was speaking with, um, uh, with another contributor of to Aftershock in the morning. It was Parag Khanna and he was all the way in Singapore. And he said, hey, I'm, I'm self-isolating. I've been here at home for two and a half weeks. And everybody, everybody that I speak with, has been self-isolating and they've been at home. They've been spending time with family and um, good or bad, I, I think it's just a, a change that we all never planned for because people like yourself and me and Parag and everybody else, we literally have full schedules right now. This is March, April, May, spring is here. Uh, literally my seven to 10 events have been canceled in the next few weeks. So I'm also home and um, I'm doing other things that I was uh, planning to do but trying to make the best of it and, and hoping that we can take this time to do uh, work that we wouldn't have done otherwise, but definitely want everybody to be safe around us and, and communities and, and uh, people everywhere to be safe. Uh, I'll give you a quick update here in Canada. Today morning, uh, the prime minister announced a bunch of incentives and it's, it's all about how we're going to work with the United States. And something that worries me is the state of affairs in the United States right now, because I don't believe they're very ready for uh, the you know, mass explosion of this virus. I don't believe so. So I'm really, really hoping for the best. And, uh, but no, 
politicians are working on it, medical teams are working on it nonstop, um, and uh, it's just uh, it's just a situation that we all are dealing with. Let's we talk. We are. L we are. We're, we're dealing with it as as a species. Um, we are. We are. It, it is the first time in human history that all of humanity is truly united. We're all fighting this at the same time. We're all trying to pool our resources and our intelligence on this. Um, it, is, it is a global war of humanity versus virus. And we've never been united as a species before. And this yeah. is humanity's make or break time. This is, you know, either we, we, we kind of keep civilization more or less on the rails or else we don't. And each of us has to show up and you know, put our dog in this fight and, and make sure that, that we come out of this all right. This is perhaps our finest hour. And my, my hope is that we can pull a kind of Apollo 13 moment and um, use our ingenuity to MacGyver uh, incredible solutions for this and, and to distribute those to everyone who needs it. Absolutely. And I'm hoping we all come out of it stronger. We definitely will. We are very resilient as a species and hence we are here pushing the boundaries of everything every single day and talking about the future and pushing boundaries. Toffler wrote his book 50 years ago. I, 50 years is, is like 500 years ago. It's so, it, that time is so gone. It's, I mean, imagine what we've done in the last 10 or 15 years. The world has dramatically changed. How did Toffler know that this would be the world 50 years ago? What do you have to say about that? I think, I think 50 years ago, we were seeing a lot of issues going on in the world, such as um, resource constraints, um, uh, geopolitical issues, um, the, the ever looming threat of global thermonuclear war. Um, and to some extent, although some of those have lessened, other ones have gotten even more complicated. I think that it, uh, it might have been tricky for Toffler to understand just how advanced our computing systems have become. I, you know, that's, you know, if you look at old, old movies like 2001, A Space Odyssey from 1966, you know, they, a lot of things they, they got right. Uh, a lot of things they didn't quite get right. We're, we're not quite um, taking trips to the moon. Um, but equally, we're not reading our news from a, a teleprinter either. Um, and so I think in some ways, the world has advanced massively forward, particularly in the digital realm and in areas which have become digitized. But also, I think there's, there's a lot of work to, yet to be done. And that kind of ties in with, with my essay, my contribution for this book. Because my take on things is that since the Industrial Revolution, we got really, really good at making stuff, right? You know, mass producing things at high quality, massive quantities and very cheap. But what we haven't nailed is the decommissioning of items. We haven't yet nailed how we dispose or recycle of things and particularly how we manage those costs created by an act or by a product and how those affect other people. So in economics terms, those are sometimes called um, externalities or spilled costs. Essentially, when, when somebody does something uh, or there's a transaction and it happens to affect an unrelated third party, think of pollution, for example, you know, it could be pollution smoke in the air it could be a nightclub that you know noise comes out of and then that that annoys people those are externalities now sometimes externalities can be positive for example if um, if a rich person has a child with a disease and spends a lot a lot of money researching a cure then that will create a positive externality for other people who may uh, develop that disease as well typically they are uh, we think of them in, in negative terms. Now, in my view, in my estimation, economists typically shrug 
at shifted costs and externalities. They are something which is bound to happen, but we don't really have much way of controlling. Simply, it's too complicated and too difficult to, to manage these things. And I actually think that's, that's a misnomer. I think we can start to manage externalities in new ways, thanks to the power of artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, machine intelligence, the internet of things, and kind of um, crypto blockchain type um, crypto and security mechanisms, things which I call, I call machine economics, because that's essentially what, what these things are. They're about um, aligning incentives in new ways. And so we have an opportunity to automate the accounting of externalities for the first time. So basically, we have, we have wonderful examples where, for example, the, um, the Earth Defense Fund, I believe, they, they put some, some pollution sensors on, on backpacks, big, big things, you know, like weighing mm -hmm. quite a lot of, um, of mass, but they, they basically put these backpack air sniffers um, on, on people, on researchers, and had them walk around the boroughs of New York and they were able to, to, to take the data from these sniffers and to triangulate down to the individual building where particulates were coming from. And so it turned out that, you know, basically there was an 80-20 rule. Uh, most of the pollution was coming out of, out of a few small dwellings. And so they were able to, to fix those. And then within the space of two to three years, the air quality in the whole of New York completely transformed, right? Because you could start to detect and account and manage these externalities. And now we're starting to see similar programs with um, Google Street View cars. So the cars that come through your neighborhood once or twice a year, they now have pollution sensors. And those pollution sensors were able to detect that ammonia-based fertilizer companies who make fertilizer in massive quantities for, for agriculture, in the US they are generating three times more methane than all of the rest of industry in the US combined. You know, and, and methane is like about, about 80 times um, more harmful to, yeah. to the uh, mm -hmm. global warming situation than, than CO2, at least in the shorter term. Yeah. And we had no idea. Nobody had any idea at all. Um, and now we do. And so this, I believe, is, is a sea change. It's, it's, um, we're entering a new era where we're able to detect these kinds of externalities in an automated way. Yeah. and to enable the accounting and trading and automated redress of them. And that's going to change everything. Absolutely. And this is the idea of automated externality accounting that you've passionately pursued and you've, you're passionately, you talk about this. Now, tell me a little bit about where is this translating, the idea of um, the automated externality accounting? What else is happening in the world or what would you like it to do in the future? Where would you like to see it? implemented well here's the thing it's I, I think that this is this concept is quite pertinent to where we are today not just because of trying to manage pollution trying to manage um, climate in different ways but actually one of the worst externalities which is unmanaged is fragility you see, our, our massively globalized world of, of trading networks and just-in-time um, supply lines is very efficient, which is great, but it also has quite clearly created a lot of fragility. And when inevitably things go wrong, whether that's a tsunami, a hurricane, or a pandemic, um, we're now seeing the effects on, on the wider economy. And so if... If some portion of the benefit of those increased efficiencies was obliged to be set aside to pay for the externality of increased fragility that is created, then we would have a massive fund 
to, to solve these kinds of problems. We would be sitting on mountains of PPE, uh, et cetera. We would have slush funds to, to helicopter money in um, to help this various situations without having to, to go into massive inflation, et cetera, right? Yeah. And so I think that, that this is what is going to enable us to, to have our cake and to eat it too, to mm. enjoy the efficiencies of, um, of a mostly free market capitalist system, but whilst being able to rein in some of the, the worst um, effects in terms of fragility, in terms of effects upon society and people's social and uh, psychological welfare as well. Automated externality accounting is the kind of the missing expansion pack which makes capitalism work truly for everyone in my view. Now, when you talk about, uh, I want to change gears here and talk about uh, machine learning, machine intelligence, uh, and you clearly work a lot within that area. How far is machine intelligence today or machine learning or AI or whatever the term we end, end up using, how far are we with respect to AI detecting disease, detecting the next outbreak of a pandemic or predicting things that we as human beings cannot do? And of course, it's working with a lot of data, working with a lot of information uh, and predicting and, and modeling that. Now, we know a few years ago, I think it was the last Ebola breakout maybe that Google had deployed technology that was able to somehow predict a little bit to some uh, level of um, accuracy where the next outbreak would be depending on what people were searching for. But I don't think it was an accurate mechanism. Give us your insights on this. Yeah, I think, I think we have tremendous opportunities. Machine intelligence is wonderful for making sense out of chaos, right? Whether that is economic chaos, social chaos, um, the chaos of, of a natural system like weather, um, machines or machine intelligence is really good at making sense of this. Um, even, if, even if something is ineffable, if we cannot put it into words or mathematics, but we know it when we see it, we can train machines what to look for through examples. Um, and that's, that, that's a real game changer because it means that machines can help us to solve problems which may appear to be essentially intractable. Now, there are, there are compounding effects when you have more data. If you think about it, you can have a piece of text which has some information in it. But if you add a picture to that text, a diagram or a figure, then the text itself becomes more valuable, right? And it's a similar thing with data. Since the dawn of human history, say 10,000 years ago, when we first started living in, in towns, up until the year 2000, Everyone who ever lived up until the year 2000 created about 5 billion gigabytes of information, right? Five exabytes, yeah. huge amount of info. And yet, thanks to the power of the internet, our ability to move information around, to process it, we managed to double that amount of information every 10 hours by the year 2010. Since then, we've had the smartphone revolution. Yeah. And now, in 2020, we're doubling that same amount of information, 5 billion gigabytes, roughly every 10 seconds. So we are sitting on an enormous trove of information. And every layer of information we have adds more context to the information we already have. So for example, you know, the internet, BBSs were, were just text, and then we, had, um, then we had the World Wide Web, and we started to get pictures, and then we started to get a little bit of video, and then we got social information, locational information, health information. All of these things enrich existing data as well. And all of this data can be turned into data sets, so examples that machines can learn from. And so even a very intelligent brain is still dependent on the information that it has to work with. And the, 
explosion in the amount of data that we have is making machines very, very capable in a short period of time. And that's why I think that one of the best tools that we have to deal with chaotic situations now is, is AI and ML. And um, there are many groups of which I'm part of a few are now um, striving to apply the very best of these techniques to, to deal with the, the pandemic situation and its uh, various sequelae. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, incidentally, I'm also uh, working on my uh, documentary film called AI, the Next Frontier. And I spoke with some really incredible people in there. Um, uh, Daniela Russ from MIT, and there's Lucas Cantor. He's a composer, but he used AI to finish an unfinished symphony is a few, from a few hundred years ago. And there's really incredible people in there that talk about what the possibilities of AI are and what they are not and how it's being used right now for social good, um, trade, a bunch of things. So it's really insightful. It's been a really great learning experience for me as well to, to talk to these people and, and say, hey, what, what is tomorrow looking like? One of the things that has consistently come up is that the AI that we see in films and movies and all of that is, is a very far complex um, combination of AI and robotics and machine learning and IoT, like devices and machines, the terminators or whatever devices those are, are just way too complex than anything else that we have right now. So I think we need to have a clear understanding of the, that the present is very, very different than the future that we think we are in right now. Um, and uh, researchers uh, from Stanford, as an example, um, and other institutions, they always say that, hey, we're still in the era of artificial uh, narrow intelligence. We're still there. We haven't even moved to artificial general, and it's going to be two, five, seven years before we maybe start working in that realm. So things are different on the ground. Implementation of these technologies is such a challenge because on the surface, it might look like we're sitting on trillions and trillions of gigabytes of data, but then processing that data costs money. Um, companies need to work on their existing businesses then to put money on R&D. So, it's, it's just so complex. And the more, as you mentioned, the more amount of data that we generate, the more data sets we get, it definitely increases the possibilities of machines learning and studying that data, but then it takes that time to compute and process that information. Uh, and it's opening up so many different opportunities for new learners, for new graduates, uh, new careers that I'm so excited for the new generation that, um, and people always complain that technology is reducing the number of jobs out there and it's killing jobs, but it's opening up so much more. And I know you're part of uh, Singularity, right? You do work with uh, Singularity University as an, yeah. as a, as a, educational organization. Tell us about the future of technology and jobs and the opportunities that people have to learn some new things. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I am um, on the AI faculty at Singularity University, but I'm, I'm also one of the judges of the XPRIZE, ANA Avatar yes. <clears throat> Prize. And and so that's, that's a prize for the very best telepresence avatar, right? Um, it's a $10 million pot, so quite a, quite a chunk of money. And we are, we're trying to stimulate the creation of a telepresence avatar that has essentially human-like capabilities, the capability of movement, capability of, of sensors, hearing, haptics, um, and an extended duration as well. And I think that that is going to open up tremendous new capabilities for, for teleworking, if you will, and for, yeah. for kind of a globalized workforce. But also I think it's going to enable us to train AI in new ways. So, so these, these telepresence robots, it's kind of like, like putting on a, an HMD, a head-mounted display, like an Oculus Rift or something, right? Yeah. And you, you know, you, you wear this to see through and then you have some, some gloves. Um, and through that, you're able to basically operate or teleoperate a robot in another yeah. place, right? Yeah. But your experiences will be 
broadly akin to how you might experience the world yourself with stereo cameras, stereo audio, et cetera, and some, some level of haptics and proprioceptive um, ability. Now, what that means is that, you know, we have a world today where center work in different countries around the world, right? And, you know, a lot of a lot of more developed countries have farmed out work to less developed countries for the moment. But pretty soon we're going to be enjoying a world where people can tell they commute into a robot and then actually show up as a security guard <laughs> in yeah. another place, right? Or do somebody's laundry or clean the dishes in a restaurant, but still be physically in a whole other country. And so they can be earning hard currency, right, in another place and then spending that where they are, right, where that money is effectively worth a lot more when they yes. can do a lot more with it. Yes. And so this has tremendous ramifications in a world of migration crises, et cetera, where essentially a, a loss of hope um, in somebody's locale um, you know, makes them want to, to go to another place. And also... Essentially, if you have a, a, a if you're operating a robot and, and doing something which is, you know, broadly akin to how a human might might do it, then that creates tremendous data sets mm. for machines to learn from, right? Just like how if you're driving an autonomous vehicle or semi-autonomous vehicle, shall we say, it's learning from how you drive, right? It's, it's learning intangible things like oh, there's, there's a truck that's got like some gravel in it. I won't get too close to that in case some of that comes out and chips my windscreen, right? Um, those are things you can't really program into a machine, but, but with a lot of virtual experience, the whole fleet of vehicles can learn those kinds of simple things. Mm -hmm. And we can do something similar with these avatars. The avatars operated by humans are going to be the bridge that gets us towards these very intelligent robots that are um, completely autonomous and are able to do all of these things themselves. Absolutely. I wish we could have this conversation for a much longer time, but I know we're out of time, but I really want to thank you for your time now. There's so much more to talk about and hopefully we'll have another opportunity uh, to connect and, and to do a, a show, a podcast, or, or, or just to talk. Um, I want um, to, uh, Tell our viewers where they can find out, find out more about you and uh, follow you, uh, your work. Sure. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the, the content that I, I, I put in the book, you can find at pacha.org, P-A-C-H-A.org. And also uh, uh, you can read some of my, my other writings at nellwatson.com. That's N-E-L-L, watson.com. NellWatson.com. Thank you so much, Pacha.org uh, and NellWatson.com. Nell, thank you for your time. I wish you a safe uh, time, downtime, happy times with family and uh, the good times of reflection. And um, I'll be in touch and uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you all so much. Ciao for now. Hey thank friend, you. this is Ian Khan. If you liked what you saw on my video, then please subscribe to my YouTube channel and be inspired every single day with innovative content that keeps you fresh, updated, and ready for the future. For more information, also visit my website at iankhan.com.